The next speaker, Oleg, who will give the first lecture of his mini course, quantum field theory and topology. So, uh, I would like to start from some small clarifications about this course. So, uh, if you look at the set of all Russians, <laughs> then there are two maps. One I would call an informality map, and another it goes by formality map. So, the informality map takes Michael or uh, Mikhail to Misha, Alexander, to Sasha, and the others. So that's where the Misha comes from. It's kind of handy given the amount of Russians. It's good to know given the number of Russians and the West in general and here in particular. Kolya. Yeah, well, maybe let, let me, yeah, six steps. <laughs> Oh, yeah? Almost all of the Russians are called Misha, Sasha, or Kole, so you can just <laughs> arbitrarily call them like that. <laughs> all right, now, uh, so then about the course itself. So, Sasha Voronov uh, wrote me an email a few days ago asking whether I plan to follow the plan of my talks, which was posted on the web. So and then with uh, first surprise and then horror, I went to the web page of this conference, you know, and I discovered something which I never noticed before, that if you scroll down there on the first page, then you see some plan of the lectures. <laughs> now, <laughs> it looked like a yearly course and something. So uh, I was in panic, but fortunately when I arrived and I asked, Dennis, he told me that it was his plan for the whole conference and not for my mini course, so I guess I can skip some part of it. At least. <laughs> so, uh, let me start. So, I would like today to start from some things which are very well known to any physicist. Uh, but which many people unfortunately never learn because some standard physical courses are not incorporated in our math studies by some bizarre reasons. So, um, so when you look at uh, some path integrals, which is an infinite dimensional, so I have some space of um, phi, some functional space, which is infinite dimensional, I have some action functional, and we look at such an object, which mathematically doesn't really make sense, but nevertheless, uh, and we look what happens when the scaling, when, when the parameter k um, goes to infinity. Now, physicists tell us that there's some standard Feynman diagram technique and that if you do everything correctly, if you uh, follow the Feynman rules and you maybe do some other additional steps such as BRST and then renormalization, etc., then you get very uh, natural um, answer for this path integral in terms of sums over some graphs. So today I would just like to explain how does it work. So how come the word uh, stationary phase didn't appear? Well, it will appear immediately now. So um, what you think about is the following, that when k tends to infinity, then that's the famous stationary phase method, which tells you that basically uh, the only places which really contribute to this integral are the critical points of this function. But uh, if you would like to say something more precisely, if you would like to ask how does it look like, what are the contributions of some small area kind of in your functional space around each point, then you would try to do some perturbative theory and then you just stay in some point, in the critical point of this functional, 
Can you think that, well, if you have some function and you stay in a critical point, then you can, of course, think that locally near this point, it looks like a quadratic part plus some higher order terms. So uh, a very important thing is to think about E i x square, or sometimes instead of i, you consider Euclidean analog minus k s of phi. So equally important is this integral plus some additional terms. And here x is some vector in n-dimensional space. So in fact, this is some bilinear form. I will, I will uh, write precisely what I mean slightly later. So and everybody should know at least how to compute the simplest integral. So this is just a little trick when you, instead of doing usual integral in one variable, you say, well, let's pass to two variables and consider it as a square root of, of the square of this integral. And then the square of this integral you write like that, you pass to polar coordinates, and then you can easily compute this integral. So, in general, if you start, let's now move slightly further. So, in general, if I just uh, do Let's see. Uh, let me start from just the standard maybe thing, which is, well, OK. So consider Z of B, which will be the integral of dV. Here V is n-dimensional, so it's the product from I equal 1 to n, maybe to D, let me of the dimension d of d v i of the following of the exponent. I will consider the Euclidean case. So I'll just take minus half v t a v plus d t v. So what is written here? So I just fix some by linear form, so think about it as d by d matrix. I think about v as a vector, column vector. So vt is uh, just a row vector. So this is the quadratic part. And I add some linear part. So this is just some linear addition here. Of course, if I would remove that, it would be precisely kind of a generalization of this case. But even with B, it's very easy to compute. So let me write the answer. As well known, it's just, oh, well, OK, I'll squeeze it here. So it's just 2 pi in power d over 2, then the determinant of A in power minus uh, half, and then times, well, I, uh, not too much space left. You know, let, let me move to the next one. Oops. So this is. Oh, yes, okay. That's true. So then this is just 2 pi power d over 2, determinant of a or half. And then uh, there's a new piece coming from, from this b, from the additional linear term. Um, which is the exponent of bt a inverse b. Minus where? 
Oh, here. Yes, of course. Sure. So, this 2 pi in power d over 2 comes just from this simple Gaussian integral. The determinant is also very easy to understand if you will think about the diagonal case. Just think about the diagonal matrix, and then you will immediately see that. And this is also rather standard. Now, what is important is that A inverse appears here. Now, or I will rewrite it in terms of the same integral when B vanishes, so that I have just the quadratic form. So then the last term is just 1, and this is my Z0, which corresponds to B equal to 0, times the exponent of BT A inverse B. Now, now let's consider the following object. It's very closely related to this integral. And we consider so-called endpoint functions. which are objects of the following sort. So I will just denote them by v i1, etc., to v. Uh, let's make it into m point functions, maybe. v i m. And this is the following. This is the integral of the same sort. So it's just integral over dv of the exponent um, of minus half v t a v. But now I multiply it by a monomial of the form v i 1, etc., v i m. And I normalize it slightly by writing the term of 1 over z naught, which is just this thing here. OK, so the only difference is that these product of v's appear on the right-hand side in the integral. Now, how can we compute it using just these functions at b? Well, that's pretty simple. So just note that. If I would take my ZB and take the derivative with respect to some DBI, uh, say, of this, all this stuff of DVX, hmm? Sorry, uh, these. These are some indices between 1 and d. Uh, they, hmm? What are the vi's? Vi's. Uh, so you should just think these are coordinate functions. I just don't want to use x for them, because x for me afterwards will play some other role. But, but these are just x, which will appear here. Okay. So, so these are just vectors in n-dimensional Euclidean space. Yes. So these, hmm? These are coordinates. These are just coordinates in, in n dimensional space. All right. Uh, I don't want to. You see, my vector v is a vector of v1, etc., to vd. I don't want to take them in the same order. And sometimes I want to take them equal. You know, say I want to take something like v1 square, something of that sort. So you're just sort of choosing I just choose some monomial in these coordinates. Just an arbitrary monomial here. So I guess the left hand side has no the left hand side has no notation. This is just by it's a notation, it's the definition. So, so this is the definition of an endpoint function. The usual notation is like. 
So it's just this integral. Now the question is, how can we compute it using this previous integral? So it's pretty straightforward. Just know that if I would take here, oops, v t. Sorry. Maybe it would be helpful to clear. You could have a vision for any m functions of v. Yes, of course. All right. Yes. Yes, that's true. Okay. So. So I'm interested, in fact, on the long run, I would be interested to take here any m functions. But, uh, uh, but meanwhile, let's do it just for the simplest one, which are linear functions. So uh, you know, I, I just don't want yet to move to infinite dimensional things. I, I want to stick for quite a while to find a dimensional analog. So um, what if you differentiate uh, this integral? Well, it's quite obvious. So this is just the sum of over bi's times vi's. Right? So this I can think about as the sum of over all i's or rather j's, maybe, j's of b, j, v, j. So when I differentiate it with respect to b, i, it will pick only the term where g equals to i. So um, the coefficient there will be v, i. So this is just dv exp of minus half v t a v plus b t v and then times v i. Right? That's downstairs. That's downstairs, yes. This is already out of the exponent. Let's see around the exponent. Okay, just Just think that I had e in power um, uh, alpha x d dx. Yes, and I can see. It. Okay, so this alpha goes downstairs. That's what happened. All right. So so hence I can interpret these integrals where I have all these monomials in Vs by taking several derivatives here. Okay. So I can reinterpret this function as just writing it as d d b i1, etc. D D B I M of this integral. X of minus half. Half. Of Z B. Okay, and then I should evaluate it in point b equal to zero. So this is very simple, but very useful for now. All right, now let's rewrite it. Again, slightly differently, maybe. I would like to. Oh, to Z naught. Yes, of course, sure. Oh, Jesus. Just put an arrow. Wow. Yeah, well, no. Okay. It's a tough work. Okay, here we go. So here I stick one over 
can see not. Okay, but let's not stop here. Let's just write it more explicitly. So I just continue. And this is the sequence of derivatives. So I will write it again the same derivatives, dd, bi1, etc., up to d, d, b, i, m. And now instead of z, b, I will write uh, the answer there. So I normalized it, right? So what I have left is exponent of b, t, a inverse b. I should, of course, again do that at the same point, b equals to 0. So up to now, there, was, there were no graphs, nothing even which looked like graphs. But to compute this, we can use a very useful and beautiful thing, which is called Wick's theorem. which tells us how to compute such a derivative. So it turns out that, and I will explain why, that this is the sum over all pairings. Uh, let me call them I, P1. Oh, too many indices, huh? I, P2, I, P m minus 1 i p m of i1 i m. It just means that I should take all this set, these m numbers, and somehow to unite them into pairs. And then here I should just write this operator a inverse this quadratic form with pairs of indices. So here goes IP1, IP2 times A inverse of IP3, IP4 times, etc. A inverse IPM minus 1, IPM. Okay, now why does this happen? So, of course, I can just say that it's by Weeks theorem, but just for you to, to get the feeling of why does this happen, well, look, every time when we differentiate here, some b, so then I will have always some exponent times some polynomial. And every next derivative can act, if you wish, either on the exponent or on the polynomial. Now, since finally we want uh, to compute everything in point b equals to 0, then I should kill all b's which will stay in this polynomial part. Okay. But whenever I differentiate the exponent part, you see here b appears twice. So one of them will go down. I, as if it's exponent of b squared times. Okay, so every differentiation of the exponent gives me a factor of b downstairs in my polynomial. So it should be killed afterwards by some other derivative. That's why these derivatives should be grouped in pairs. Okay. Yeah, well. Half, yes, of course I forgot my half, right? Did I forget it before also? No, it's OK. It's half. Oh, Jesus. Just a second. So I forgot halves already in several places, right? Eh? Half here. Half here. Anywhere else? That's it again. Well, that looks better. OK. Now, this we can already draw as some graph.
Well, it just shows that if m is not even, then it vanishes. You know, because when you would try, so, so just try if you exponent, say you had exponent of b square. Okay? Now, you, you now differentiate it once, d, d, b. But then you should take it in b equals to zero. It will vanish. Okay? Well, we also see it from here, right? Because the integral is a, is, is a yes. function times something yes. which is okay. like Yes, function. indeed. Right. Yes, okay. So you see that it's non-zero only when m is even. Now, how can this be rewritten in terms of graphs? So, Misha, mm -hmm. are there any Again? When you write exponential as b to the n I don't probably want to write them as sum of factorials because then I would have to differentiate the factorials. Okay. No, I think it, it's pretty okay. Just check it in one dimensional case. Okay, now the pictures. So here we go for the pictures. So whenever I want to pick some pairing of these indices, what do I do? Well, let me just draw here on the blackboard i1, i2, etc., i3, i4, whatever, blah, 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 i m. And then I would like to pair them in some ways. So I will, these pairings I will just denote by drawing here a line connecting these two. So such, say, drawing would show a pairing where I1 and I2 are paired and I3 and I M are paired. Okay. So you have a set of M points and I just connect them by intervals like that. Now suppose, so so let me give some examples if, if these indices, so when I compute, say, v1, v2, v3, v4, what kind of pairings will I have? Well, the pairings will be the following. I have four points. Uh, enumerated by 1, 2, 3, and 4. And I should pair them in all possible ways. Again, 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. So, first way to pair these is to pair 1 to 2, 3 to 4. Another possibility here would be to pair 1 to 3 and 2 to 4. Finally, we could also pair 1 to 4 and 2 to 3. So this is the set of all pairings of four indices, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So the answer here should be A inverse. Now I should write the indices of of this matrix, A inverse, will correspond to this, to the first pair, and then to the second pair. This term corresponds to this graph. Then there will be the term corresponding to the second graph. You can already guess the indices. It will be 1, 3, 2, 4, this is the term corresponding to the second graph. Finally, there's the last term, A inverse 1, 4, A inverse 2, 3. Now, let me do a very similar example, only I will take the same V1 three times. 
V1, 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 V1 and V2. Again, I will look at all ways to pair these indices. So now I have almost the same pictures, only now my four points here are labeled by three of them are labeled by one, and only the fourth is labeled by two. So I will just draw again the same pictures. But now notice that I can just draw it differently. So here it will be what? Well, this picture I can redraw in the following way. I just have the point labeled by one, the point labeled by two. This point is, first of all, it's paired to itself. And then an additional time it's paired to two. Here it's always the same. So in all these cases, I will have the same graph. It's always once one is paired to itself and then to two. So in all these cases, I will see this graph. So what I should do is I should write the terms corresponding to these pairings. So for these, it will be A inverse 1, 1, A inverse 1, 2. And then there's only a question, how many times should I count it? And as you can see from this picture, in fact, these pairings, these, uh, this is the wrong way to count pairings. You just say that you pair one to one and one to two. So these, this is the graph kind of responsible for it. Right? But you should figure out, so here there will be a little exercise to compute the coefficient. I will give a general answer in a few minutes. But let you mean what I think about it. Oh, jeez. Okay, so... So the graphs essentially start to appear because of the Weeks theorem about the pairings. These graphs, in the simplest case, when all these indices appearing in the endpoint function are different, this will be just, they will have m vertices, distinct vertices, and then somehow they will be paired by intervals. But when I look at the endpoint function, where the same index appears several times, then, just as it happened here, the graphs will become already less trivial. There will be some loops there, there will be in general less points, and that's how these graphs appear. So, essentially, these are already Feynman graphs. I'm just talking, meanwhile, about the finite dimensional case, but uh, this is how things work. Okay, now, we worked up to now only with very simple uh, expressions standing under the exponent. Only purely quadratic part, and then I was adding the linear one, but it was just purely technical. So this was up to now only the quadratic part. Now, let's try to compute now some more general object, which I will call Z of U, and this will be the uh, integral dV of the exponent, where now we will plug in, in addition to this term, we'll plug in some term u of v, where u of v is some function of the coordinates. So, and then the question is, how can we rewrite this? 
how can we compute it? So again, this is the notation for this integral. So uh, what will it be? Well, let's uh, write this first as a product of two exponentials, and then expand the second exponential. So I will rewrite it first as dv x of the same thing which we've already seen before. And then consider the expansion of the second exponential. So it will be the sum over, say, n of 1 over n factorial u of v in power n. Okay. Now let's see uh, what can we do now. See, each of these objects we've already seen before. So I think that, uh, say, uh, u is some, if I will think the simplest, let's take the simplest case. When this is some monomial or polynomial of the coordinate functions, the general case will be obvious from here. So let's consider just the case, meanwhile, well, say this is a polynomial, a monomial, polynomial of the coordinate functions. Then each of the terms here will be something of this form, right? Only without this normalization. But that's easy to compute if you already computed the previous answer. So. What we will do now, let's, let's write it in the following fashion. So we'll write here z naught times, and then we know that we should write many derivatives. Every time when I have some monomial here, it leads to some derivative. So I will combine them all together under one exponent. So it will be the exponent of u where instead of u of v, I will take u of d, d, b. So I, I will now do some example, so it will become clear. And then exponent of b, t, a inverse of my favorite half last again, b. And I should do it at b equal to 0. Okay. All right. So let's do it on this blackboard. Let's do some example. Uh, let's try to compute something. So I will call it phi cube theory which it's not, of course, but, <laughs> but still, it will be somehow uh, reminiscent of high cube theory. So let's take u of v to be some, let's take h, u, i, j, k, v, i, v, j, v, k. So some cubical term. So u will be a polynomial of the third degree here. Only terms of the third degree appear. These are coefficients. And I sum over all i, j's, and k's. And this is just a constant, because it will be easier for me to count things. So then um, I just write explicitly this z of u. <coughs> this will be this integral dv x blah 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 minus half v t a v plus h u i j k v i v j v k equals and then let's rewrite it the way we did here so this will be 
z naught times exponent of now what will be this exponent? Well it will be the thing of the sort h u i j k. These are just coefficients times d d b i d d b j d d b k. Again I sum over all i j's and k's here this formula, implicitly. And then I apply this differential operator to the exponent of half bt a inverse b. And I evaluate everything in the point b equals to 0. So let's compute the terms of degree, say, for the example. So terms of degree 2, by which I mean the coefficient of h square, by which graphs will they be given? Let's see. Jeez. OK. So by Weeks theorem, again I will use the Weeks theorem. So it will correspond to the following. These will be the sums. Again, I should sum over all i, j, k's. And I'll call them i prime, j prime, k prime. And then I should take the operator of this. You see, the h squared will appear in the exponent when I take the second power of this. OK, so there will be six derivatives here. So, well, maybe I, uh, you know what, no, let's not, let's write an intermediate step. So it will be u i j k d d b i d d b j d d b k times the same only with i prime j prime k prime same d d b d b k prime apply to this exponential of half b t a B, and then everything computed point B equal to 0. And then the Weeks theorem will give it as the sum over all pairings Let's call them I1, I2, etc. I 5i6 of i j k i prime j prime k prime and then these guys a inverse i1 i2 times a inverse of i phi i6 Now, it's not all because I forgot here these coefficients. These are some numeric coefficients. Otherwise, there would be no interest. i j k times u i prime j prime k prime. So what is it in terms of graphs? It means that essentially, Oh. Will you see out there? Slightly too dark now. Oh, I just don't want to remove it right now. Okay. So, let's 
let's draw these bearings in the following way. We'll now draw the following graphs. We'll draw two graphs. We'll explain what are these graphs. Now, in each vertex, I will put, say, if I have a trivalent vertex, I will put the triple of indices, i, j, k, in one of them. In the second vertex, I will put the triple of indices, i prime, j prime, k prime. And then I can naturally write these pairings uh, by connecting these guys. Okay. Now, the ways to connect six indices, if I have, so or rather six indices, somehow they will be the following. So I have uh, what, I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, I6. Now, remember that for each such pairing, I should take also these coefficients. So such a graph, I count with coefficient. So this counted with coefficients. U, I1, I3. I5 times U, I2, I4, I6. Okay. And the same here. So this graph, hmm? yes, so where are the A's? So meanwhile, I just counted these U's. And I can identify them, if you wish, with some weights which I put in these vertices of this graph. So when I have a graph of that sort, which should consist of three pairs of indices, then at each vertex I see three indices, and these are the three indices which appear here in U. So each vertex gives me its own U. And then times, then I should count these products of A's. Now, there will be products of three A inverses here. So where can they be? Obviously, here on the edges. So each edge will give me A inverse, factor of A inverse. So it will be I1, I2, A inverse, I3, I4, A inverse, I5, I6. Product of the evens over the product of the odds. Yes, in a sense. Formally. So, so what will be the difference here of this graph and this graph? Well, it will be almost the same. The only difference will be that these indices in U's and in A's will appear slightly differently. Okay, so here I, I will not do it again, but it's rather obvious how to write it. So. The general way to write such an answer will be to instead of these, I will write it as follows. I will write here the sum over graphs, which are what? Uni trivalent? No, only trivalent. So trivalent. And there are precisely two trivalent vertices, three edges. Yes? So uh, two with two vertices. Okay. And then that's the product, which is taken over all edges. And then a term of the form A inverse I will write it sloppily just as an H. So by this I mean that there's a product of indices sitting on the H. Now these graphs, I also, in addition to 
to different combinatorial types, maybe I should write uh, that they are that each edge here going out of a vertex is labeled by some index and I sum over all the indices afterwards. And there's also the product over vertices of the term of the form u. I will write it here like u of the vertex. Indeed, every time I label these edges in each vertex, I have a triple of indices. So it will give me these triple of indices. And now the last thing which I should do to be careful is to count each such graph with coefficient. I should subdivide it by the number of the symmetries of this graph. <coughs> Graphs G. So in general, say what we did here, these were just two vertices. So you see that here, if I look at the homology of this graph, there are two independent loops. Right? So that's why in physics it's called two loop terms. Okay? So this is two loop. Oops. Two loops. So in general, the summation, so I just did here graphs of order uh, two of degree two, so this was the coefficient of h square. But the general, what are called Feynman rules in this case, will be the following. So if here I will. Sum over labels, perhaps? Yes, and over labels, yes. Maybe I should sum over labels. Labels. So, yes, let's count the number of automorphisms of such graphs. So for this graph, I have, let's see how many automorphisms do I have. So first of all, there's, uh, uh, well, OK. So that I can interchange these two edges, or these two, or these two edges. OK, this gives me already three automorphisms. Then there's also uh, the way to interchange these, right? So how many together? Three factorial. Three factorial. Well, Twelve. Where else? So? Hmm? Twelve. And for this one? So I remember that I can also twist these lobes. Kind of like that, right? So? Eight. Okay. Let's, let's write it there. Or, yes, I would. I also would count it as a. I was never, though, very good in this kind. I'm never sure. Yeah. Well, it looks. On the physical level of rigor, I'd say. Okay, so um, now the general formula for degree, uh, say, n, which will be the coefficient of h in power n here will be given by so-called Feynman rules, where I do the same, only instead of two vertices, there should be n vertices. And I do precisely the same. So this is basically the essence of this Feynman diagram technique. Now, of course, I was careful enough to do it meanwhile only in the finite dimensional case. So physicists do it in infinite dimension. Yes. So here the, the, the answer, say here, the total answer will be the sum over all trivalent vertices. Trivalent graphs, sorry. Trivalent graphs. And then there will be well, I should also write here h in power n. Well, I, oh, here I was just doing the coefficient there. So uh, here there will be some over labels. And then there will be 
the coefficient h in power n over the number of automorphism of the graph, and then the weight of the graph. And the weight of the graph is the products, just as we did here. Okay, each age. Yes, of the level graph. Yeah. yeah. So it's the sum, the product over all ages, and each age give you gives you a inverse. And then each vertex gives you u so it will be an infinite sum in these graphs, trivalent graphs and this contribution of each edge and each vertex this is what is called Feynman rules which kind of graphs do I consider and what does each graph contribute so this the way to write these weights Yes, so, so this is called the Feynman rules. To rewrite this, uh, this object, this, this exponent, of, uh, in terms as a sum of these graphs, so this is called the Feynman rule. And this is the Feynman diagram expansion. So, so, so how much time do I have? If at all? Huh? Three minutes? Oh, good enough. Yes, of course. I, I mean, you know, after I read uh, uh, the, my supposed plan there on the web, and there were words about the churn Simons. Of course, I, I want finally next time I'll go to churn Simons theory. So this is kind of finite dimensional version, the baby model of the churn Simons. Is it essentially more you found it because you know, the answers come out in terms yes, of private yes, 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 yes. Well, I should. Uh, there, there will be slightly more technique, but sure. the essence is, is more or less here. So, um, you know, it doesn't make sense for me now to start the infinite dimensional. So, uh, my plan further is to talk about the infinite dimensional analog and then about some additional problems which appear there, which are called gauge fixing, BRST uh, construction, etc. But this is already next time, so maybe I'll finish with a little joke. Uh, in the sense of <laughs> style of yesterday's party, so yes, and the number of Russians, you know, on the conference. So, uh, an American, Russian, and Israeli meet in some pub and drink. Well, let's say in Jim's party and drink. So then, the American. <laughs> the American drinks some whiskey, throws the glass in the air, shoots it, and says, we are so rich that we never drink from the same glass twice. And then the Russian thinks, drinks some vodka, throws the bottle of vodka in the air, takes the gun from the American, shoots in the bottle, and says, we Russians have so much vodka that we never drink from the same bottle twice. And then the Israeli takes the gun from the American, shoots the Russian, and say, we Israelis have so many Russians that we never drink with the same Russian twice. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> now, why did I give this joke? You know, because Dennis already invited me last fall to give several talks at his seminar. So now I'm very grateful to him to inviting me for the same thing, the same thing. <laughs> Okay, so let us take a minute.